Thank you. Wow, this is a, um, a much larger crowd than I was expecting. So thank you all for coming. And I also wanted to thank the Columbia Museum of Art and the Education Department for inviting me to come give this. Um, typically, uh, three times a week, I'm speaking to 18 to 20 year olds <laughs> in a much larger seating format. But um, I, I welcome this opportunity to look at art through kind of a naturalist perspective. So let's go take a look. Okay, just a couple um, pieces of kind of housekeeping information. I, um, I am a professor at the University of South Carolina. Hi, Bill. Um, and also a curator at McKissick Museum at the University of South Carolina. And I um, am kind of growing into the absent-minded professor kind of role. <laughs> And so what I want to say is that when I have a question in a setting like this, I usually forget the question by the time the person invites questions, which I hate. So I want you all to please feel free to shoot your hand up or shout a question out and let me address it before, before it, you lose it. <laughs> um, what I had, um, oh, whose who's first art break event is this? Wow, so we have a lot of um, art break veterans. Uh, this is my first art break, so please be gentle. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I, I wasn't sure quite what to expect or what you would expect of me, so I'm gonna kind of, we'll settle in in each of the four kind of rooms that we have here and then I might wander around and kind of point and, and point some things out that you might be interested in. So without further ado, here we are at the Eyes on the Edge exhibit, um, Photographs of the Carolina Coast by J. Henry Fair. Has anyone actually been through here and seen the exhibit already? Is there any of you? Okay, who did the tap tour as well? Oh, just me, it was exciting, <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, so well, now I encourage you to do the tap tour. <laughs> There's a lot more information there. Um, but really, when Kaylee had asked me to give this program, she said, we want something on barrier islands. It's all going to be barrier islands. And I said, well, what do the photographs look like? I need to, because are they pictures of barrier islands? And yeah, some of them are, but like, look at that one. How am I going to talk about barrier islands there or here? <laughs> so we'll call this more of a South Carolina coastline <laughs> talk because um, there are certainly some images of barrier islands, but um, not all of them. So we're gonna start with, with a barrier island. Um, this is, I think, Captain Sam's Spit on the coast of uh, South Carolina. And what I notice here from a geologic perspective, again, I, I teach geology, um, <clears throat> is this here and that here. So um, you all are going to have kind of a quick geology lesson, less than an hour. Uh, this right here is called an inlet. It's the waterway that kind of connects this back tidal creek to the ocean here. But this is actually the spit right around here. What do you notice about this feature? Fragile. It looks fragile, okay, sure, what else? There's no trees. Well, um, there's no trees kind of along here. This is the active beach zone <coughs> in geologic jargon. But I notice, from my perspective, that there are some lines kind of coming right along there. And these are some kind of tall bushes, maybe even some trees. Now remember, he took all these photographs from an airplane. So we might have some, some short trees here. Um, but we, do you see the lines that I'm talking about? These lines are different layers of where the ocean has deposited this sand and is building up this spit. So the one thing that you need to leave here today knowing is that barrier islands, although they are a geologic feature, they are always constantly changing. Like every rainstorm, every dry spell, Every windstorm, every hurricane, every tropical storm is moving these beaches around. And so um, to put your house right here could be a little dangerous. <laughs> um, if you're going to have some forethought, you might want to put your house where the beach is being built up or accreted, what we say. Um, you definitely don't want to build where uh, sand is being removed or taken away. Um, let's see. 
Does anyone have any questions about this one? All right. I actually would it help any place on that skit? Me? No. <laughs> No, but there are people, and we'll see some of that in the next one. Yeah. We're on the coast. Where is that? Where on the coast is that? That's not that in Kiowa. Yeah. It is Kiowa no. Island, Captain Sam Spit. That's the one they're going to promote. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'll keep my mouth shut. Because there was an agreement long ago when the island was sold, the land was sold years and years ago, and they agreed that they would. Well, there are certainly some important geologic reasons to not leave it, um, to not develop on uh, islands. But, I mean, look at all that beach. People love beaches, and um, there, there are definitely some reasons that developers would want to do that. The, um, beyond the spit itself, what is the geology of this? that island and the, what the ocean is doing to the coast of us? Right here? Yes, all of that. <laughs> this to me looks like a sandbar. How can I tell? Well, you see that um, the waves are breaking right along here. And that means that underneath the surface of the water there, the land is more shallow. Um, so we've got kind of a sandbar here. And then this to me looks very deep and could very well be another channel. Um, coming across here. But again, we've, we've got just another barrier island here. Um, a little bit of information about barrier islands. They extend pretty much from Maine all the way down the east coast of the United States, around Florida, into um, all the way around to Texas, as far as the United States is concerned. And I think I wrote down 2,700 miles of barrier islands. Now, when you look at each state and you count how many islands there are, South Carolina is second. <laughs> what do you think the first one is? Florida. Florida, of course, Florida. So South Carolina, although second in number of islands, we're about fifth in um, shoreline, in the amount of shoreline. We have about um, 30 to 35 to 39 islands. Remember, they always change. <laughs> And um, it's about 153 miles of barrier island coastline that we have. Now, some features that are typical of barrier islands. They're usually kind of long and narrow. And so this is the ocean here. I did some art just for you guys. <laughs> you know, it's an art museum. You get it, right? <laughs> so here we have the ocean, and this is the, to the mainland side. So our barrier island really um, just forms kind of a little, a little hill right before the, the main coastline here. Now what's important about barrier islands is that they're protective, they are a barrier, and so that this area here, whether it's marsh or um, just a little intercoastal seaway, it, preser it kind of um, creates an area for wildlife to be protected from the ravages of the ocean here. So we see that a lot of areas right behind Barrier Islands serve as nurseries for marine life. Um, this is where you know young crabs, sea turtles, kind of are born here. Um, they don't go this way; they always go that way. But <clears throat> Barrier Islands are super important to the ecosystems that they protect. So that would be another reason to not develop <laughs> here <laughs> to protect those ecosystems. All right, the next thing. Yes, ma'am. So, are there not any barrier islands on the west coast? The west coast is very different from the east coast, and we see a lot more rocky and um, very narrow beaches along there. And there are, I don't know that there are any barrier islands on the west coast, but I will admit, I'm kind of an east coast geologist. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for anyone from, who might be from California. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Even the nature of the sand is very different. And that has a lot to do with what's happening in the Atlantic Ocean versus what's happening in the Pacific Ocean. And that's something I'll lecture on in about two weeks at USC. You can come visit me there. <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1.10 to 2. <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. I was just remembering the artist when he gave 
gave a talk here, um, spoke about how in this area, the curve in the inside. Um, this here? Right there, yeah. Um, right in dolphins here. Dolphins strand feed there, which is very unusual. Also, manatees. So, you know, when you bring in development. That's going to impact those animals. Um, the manatees, uh, maybe more so than the dolphins, tend to be a little shy and um, will want to, uh, again, find a more quiet place to hang out. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about kind of the curves that we're seeing here when we are looking at another photograph. Yes, ma'am. Um, it kind of looks like an aqua feature. In a it does. Camera. It so does. Does that eventually turn into an island? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how this, this creek is somewhat sinuous, and um, we'll talk a little bit how this creek could evolve, as creeks do, not as you know, animals do, but, um, and change over time, definitely. I feel like there was one more thing. Oh, this awesome barrier island that I have drawn you is kind of your typical barrier island shape. Some are much more long, some are fatter. The, if you think about Hilton Head, it's a very different shape, but they're all kind of drumstick shaped. And I think you can kind of see that kind of wide at one end and narrow at the other end. Um, and in this case, we have sand being removed from the top here and being deposited toward the bottom. And that's all due to longshore current. Has anyone ever floated around in the ocean, and when you look up after 30 minutes, you think, hey, my umbrella was up there. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> the longshore current kind of moved you down, so that's what was going on there. All right, I think we're going to move to the next room and take a look around. We'll take a minute to get resettled. All right, again, I don't know how most art, art break um, events go, but I'm going to talk about this one first and then you all just kind of rotate around with me. Um, again, here we're looking at Hunting Island and what I notice here from a geologic perspective is this right here. All of these trees that are in the water, um, they are drowned trees and that tells me that at one time for the trees to be here, the beach had to be way out here. So there had to be many probably successive storm events um, that have removed all the sand from here. Where did the sand go? Well, maybe down to the next island. <laughs> but also, um, we see this feature right here. It's a fishing shack, I think. House, house standing in water. Uh, and all right, <laughs> I'm gonna maybe make an assumption here that the house was not always in the water. <laughs> that this house was probably built, um, you know, away from the water. There might even be roads here that are now under the ocean. But this is kind of an, another um, very, very obvious way of looking at how these, these barrier islands are just always constantly moving. And then we see kind of this is the back area of the island, probably still on the island, but kind of a creek area, again, that would be a great nursery for a lot of marine life. I'm going to come hang out with you guys for a minute now. <laughs> um, here we're looking at Myrtle Beach, and um, I see lots of, wow, lots of things going on here. <laughs> um, <laughs> can we call this a very stark meeting of nature and, and humans? <laughs> and um, someone uh, had said to me, well, when I look at this, this is amazing. People are now able to get a house on the beach, quote unquote, right? Because most of these are campers or RVs. But what I see is that all of these RVs, say a car weighs about 4,000 pounds. How much does each one of these weigh? How much compaction is happening in this area? And so um, there is no dune system that's built up here. It should be, well, here. <laughs> uh, and it looks like there's kind of a little uh, raggedy, kind of a shrub covered wall, bushes right here. And that's really the only thing that is serving to, um, to keep that beach there. And probably with this here, we'll see a lot of this beach be eroded away over time. Um, it will likely have to be renourished over and over and again. Speaking of beach renourishment, um, here again, we're looking at Myrtle Beach. Um, this situation 
say a little bit better, no cars compacting the beach. What I see as a geologist are all the waves crashing in. And this is somewhat unusual, the way these waves are meeting the beach. Why would I say that? Why is it unusual? Well, at this point in time, these waves are meeting the beach almost straight on. There would be very little of that longshore current happening right here. Um, and that longshore current occurs when waves approach the beach at an angle, like this. Um, what happens is as a wave uh, comes towards the beach, when it gets close, we get breakers like this, and it kind of picks up some of the sand that's uh, at the bottom here, and it brings it along with the wave this way. Now then when the wave retreats, it brings it straight back. And then the next wave brings it and moves it down a little bit. And when it retreats, brings it straight back. And so that's how you, as a bobbing person in the ocean, <laughs> get moved from your orange umbrella all the way down here without really realizing it. You're brought at an angle and then straight back. You think you're just bobbing. <laughs> But um, again, here we've got a lot of people kind of enjoying the beach, and the beach is a lovely, kind of wonderful place to be. Um, me personally, this looks a little unnatural with all the um, umbrellas. <laughs> Feels a little Mediterranean, I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it's, this is a much better situation than, say, that over there. The next one I want to talk about is this one. This is coastal wetlands meet the ocean. So here we've got um, a lot kind of going on right here. This is a river system coming close to the ocean here. And this is what I would call a tidal creek. But just from a non-geologic perspective, what does this look like to you? Go ahead. A what? A snowflake. I can see that. Sure. Absolutely. A tree. Sure. Absolutely. And this type of, of system or pattern of drainage is actually called dendritic. Dendro meaning tree. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so again, I drew another picture for you. And <laughs> this one will be a little bit more difficult to see. But I have driven you, um, drawn you, excuse me, the anatomy of a stream. And so most, most streams or river systems start in the headlands or in mountainous areas that are typically in higher elevation. And then as they move downhill, those streams are typically pretty fast moving and the stream channels are straight. Now, when they get to a lower gradient, as in the, the elevation is a little flatter, the streams actually um, come together in this kind of a pattern. This is our dendritic pattern. So the stream channels come together, and what we mean are like two creeks meeting to make a bigger creek, and then a big creek meeting to make another stream to make another river, and how these, these waterways come together to make larger bodies of water. Then we finally get what's considered the trunk of the stream. Oh, we're going back to more tree terminology, aren't we? <laughs> the trunk of the stream here. And here, when the land gets very flat, you can see that the stream channel gets very, very sinuous. And this is what we call a meandering stream. Then once our stream meets the ocean here, we see this same kind of dendritic pattern. If we're lucky and the stream has been coming with enough flow, has enough sediment that it's carrying, it may actually build a delta right around these little creek patterns here. So what are they called? These are called tributaries. They come together to make the trunk of the stream. And when they split up again at the base level or the lowest level of the stream, we call those distributaries because they're not coming together, but they're coming apart now. So what I see here is a pattern of distributaries that um, are kind of emptying out into this but so why is there this bright green area here between the distributaries of, um, doesn't say what our, what our river is here, but then this, what, what's that area? Yeah, this is kind of the marsh area where we've got all of this water coming in. Um, 
<clears throat> then here in the ocean, we've got tides coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out. And those tides have formed little channels or tidal creeks. So there is probably a whole lot of water right in here <laughs> that's serving. Um, and I would imagine that the ground is pretty spongy. <laughs> What is a delta? Where a delta, again, is where a river is coming down close to the ocean. And when it gets to the ocean, um, imagine your river is carrying a lot of sediment. So when it gets to the ocean, what's going to happen? Um, the water flow slows down real fast because there's a giant body of water at the coastline here. So we've got our huge channel with sediment in it, gets to the ocean and stops. Well, that sediment settles out, and it builds up some land area around these distributaries. That's what happens um, right now at the Mississippi River Delta. Um, and these distributaries can move and change. One of them might become clogged, and then another one will, will grow a little bit further. And we see that happening a lot in uh, Mississippi River Delta. Yes, sir. Well, um, a couple of things. <laughs> I'm going to start with, we're not completely sure. <laughs> but we do know that sea level is rising. We can measure it. We can see it over there with those drowned trees in Hunting Island. And um, if all the glaciers in the world will t were to melt, sea level would rise a remarkable amount. And I think that. Um, what, what researchers are saying now, that it's not just sea level rising, but it's also where is that sand going to be moving, because now it's underwater. That's what I asked myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the sand probably would be deposited back up, but our barrier islands might be where Walterboro is now, <laughs> which people that live at Edisto Beach are going to be ha unhappy about that. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm going to talk about rice when we get to the next one. But yes. <laughs> no, there's not any sand here because this is an estuary. Um, so we don't have an active beach zone right here. But um, it could be. Yes, I would, I would imagine. Because it's an estuary. Right, <laughs> right. And we, we see the same thing in the next image as well. There's no sand here. And I don't know about the history of this um, Combi River wetlands, exactly where this was taken. But um, I do know that it was taken October 13th, 2015. Remember that time period? So <clears throat> I'm going to say it's probably a little wetter here <laughs> than it typically is. Um, but also, what I notice here is, see this drainage pattern right here? How does it compare to this one? <coughs> it's much more geometric. There you go. Penny got that one. I wish I had prizes for you all. So um, <clears throat> there are between four and nine basic shapes of um, stream drainage patterns. And again, we've looked at the dendritic pattern here. You can see how it's kind of tree-like or leaf-like. But what I see here is the rectangular pattern. And what determines these different patterns is the rock underneath that you can't see. Um, there are other patterns here, the trellis. The radial, typically, we see around a volcano or someplace that's like a dome that's high in the middle. Um, trellis patterns we see when in a lot of folded areas. But rectangular we see when limestone is underneath, um, serving as the bedrock. And here we are in coastal South Carolina. We have any limestone there? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and so just by looking at this, as a geologist, I would guess that there, um, these could be following fractures or faults within that limestone. Um, clearly, I'm not on the ground doing any research here, but this would be my first guess that we have a really distinctive drainage pattern here that's very different from everything else in the entire exhibit. OK, let's talk about rice fields. <laughs> now I'm going to look at this one. <laughs> and um, really, to be completely honest with you, not a whole lot of geology here. <laughs> 
what we're looking at is this um, circular structure here. And this was built as a, um, as a shelter for enslaved workers who were working rice fields here. And there are these interesting little wooden structures in kind of the center of the picture here. And from my not so recent visit <laughs> to rice plantations on the coast, uh, these are gateways or essentially lock systems. Um, these gates would be drawn up to allow water from the creek here to invade in the rice field or to draw water out if there was too much. So this structure right along here, that's artificial here. So that the, the rice fields could be somewhat separated from the creek. That's all the geology I see there. All right, we're gonna go into the next room. All right, I have to start with this one because I think it's the most eye-catching. <laughs> It is very beautiful, very compelling. And something that I did want to point out here that um, the artist took these photographs, again, aerially from an airplane, but <clears throat> he is an artist. Um, I do believe that these photographs have been enhanced as far as color, <laughs> but um, I don't get the sense that he photoshopped anything in, like a house on stilts in the, the picture that we saw over there. So what we're seeing, the geology and the topography or the shape of the land is real. The colors um, are really what draws our eye to them and, and allows us to appreciate them as art. And that's all the art, um, let's see, critiquing that I will do. <laughs> So what do we see here? Uh, let me read to you the title. This is Wetlands at the Entrance of the Combe River into St. Helena Sound. Um, again, October 14th. Um, so when water was very high in this state. What you're looking at here is the river system where it's very, very sinuous right before it enters the ocean out here. So it's kind of traveling back and forth, back and forth. And what one of you very intelligent people had asked me was, what about, um, this is very narrow right here, and is it possible for this to be kind of um, eroded away? And it is, absolutely. If we go back to our, uh, let's see, life of a stream. Oh, yes, I did, right here. <laughs> um, uh, my son was very kind and lent me not only his sketchbook, but his markers as well. So <laughs> here we can see our stream channel here, bounded by two bright green levees. The channel is in blue, and then these are kind of sandy areas. These are point bars where sediment would be deposited. And then almost always opposite a point bar is going to be a cut bank. What we see here, and again, I believe this is because we were in such a high flood stage. There was so much water on the entire state. We don't see any point bars or any, um, well, the cut banks, again, are gonna be right out here, <laughs> um, which the artist has kind of trimmed those areas off. That's gonna be where the channel is turning, where we see cut banks. But it is very common in situations like this, especially at a high flow time period, for water to come through and erode this part away. Right now, this is called a neck, a little tiny little skinny land area between these. These are called meanders. And if this neck um, becomes broken through by the water, completely eroded, then we call it a cutoff. And this area here, water would still usually remain in there, but this would become the main channel here. And sand or silt would eventually fill up in this area, and we'd get this little kind of U-shaped, kind of a horseshoe-shaped lake at the edge here. And this is called, it would be called an oxbow lake. Sometimes they're even called Lake Oxbow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I believe we'll see some more of this when we get to another painting. But I really liked that, wow, there's so many geology features here in this one. We can see more um, streams kind of coming in around here. Um, but again, this is kind of a, a great landscape to see kind of a meandering streams. How does the tide affect the geology of the river? I mean, what you just described sounds like a typical river yeah. Yeah. function. But how, what, how 
body functions differently when you've got the tidal change. In this area, again, um, especially out here, you see that there isn't any sand buildup. And where things get kind of um, narrow or tight in here, with tide coming in and coming out, depending on how, um, how heavy the flow is in the river, um, that would definitely wash away a lot of that sand. And again, we may not be seeing any sandbars or any development deposition out here because this picture was taken at such a high flood stage. This is not normal, I'm guessing. Has anyone been here? Yeah, me neither. I don't know. <laughs> um, I've been to St. Helena Island, but I, I haven't seen it from this perspective. And um, I would think there's got to be more, more islands kind of around in here. You can see some, some little ones kind of right in here and in here. Um, and we see some, some kind of ripples in the water here. So we know that the land is pretty shallow there. And in a normal, what I want to say is flow regime, we would probably see much more island or point bar development. In there. We just can't see it right now because it's in a flood. As we look over there, I just wanted to point out again this beautiful dendritic <laughs> stream channel here. I think this might be a lot of people's favorite. <laughs> wow, y'all did that so quickly. <laughs> it's just seamless like birds flying. Um, yeah, again, here, do you see a date on that one? Yeah, October 13th. To me, this water looks um, kind of muddy and uh, full of silt and sand. And something that we see as streams travel from the mountains to the ocean, that when they're in the mountains and they're flowing faster in straighter channels, they're able to carry larger pieces of sediment in their, in their water, in their current. So we see larger things like boulders and cobbles and pebbles this big in streams up to the north that are in the mountains. When we get down to this area, the stream has lost a lot of its energy. Remember, it's not coming down mountains anymore. It's cutting kind of flat and just flowing back and forth. So most of the sediment that we see in the stream is going to be sand and silt. And here I'm talking about size particles. They're very small um, and even clay particles which could then clog up some of these um, features here. Oh, and we're going to see that right behind you. Yay! <laughs> um, here we're looking at kind of a, a beachy area and a barrier island. But what I notice is right along here, there's been a huge storm event that has pushed lots and lots of sand up over the sand dunes and deposited it where it usually isn't deposited in a normal high tide. So you can see, if you get close, that this is all just freshly deposited sand right through here. Again, this is where the beach is being built up, right at the end of the spit here. And again, even sand has been deposited right here um, into the little creek channel there. When we look at this image, something else I notice, we've got all of our tributaries. This is our tidal creek here kind of coming together. But notice how there's a lot of vegetation around the edges. That vegetation is actually growing on kind of a little hill of sand and clay particles. And we've got a channel here. So this little hill of, um, say, buildup along either sides of the channel. What is that? Oh, there's, a, uh, there's a song about it. Who sings that song, Brian? Where are you? Is it Led Zeppelin? <laughs> About the levee breaking? <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is the levee that's forming right along the sides of the channel there. Now, I'm only going to make you get up and move two more times, <laughs> I swear. Um, we'll kind of pass along this next one, and then we'll move on to the next room here. Um, this is the New Shira River as it enters St. Helena Sound. And again, I want you to just notice these tight meanders into the larger system here. This is where our cutoff could be. There could be another one here. This one is not very well developed. But here, um, the cutoff has a lot of tall trees on it, probably because that was, that's the oldest land area that hasn't moved. Here in the channel, there's a lot of sand moving. And um, 
<clears throat> here we can also see the other creeks coming into the river here. All right, this one is titled Sand Bank Formation in Bulls Bay. And this is one of the ones that was not taken after that October flood. This is April 16th of this year. So we're in kind of a, a normal <laughs> um, situation here, but something really abnormal is happening. Um, and at first glance, what does this look like? A feather. a feather. It does look like a feather, um, but it's not. This is, <laughs> this is how beaches are actually built. These are um, individual deposits of sand that have been brought in by the ocean. Here we've got those waves approaching the beach at an angle. Um, so they're bringing sand in like this, then they'll pull it straight back, bringing it in like that, pulling it straight back. And the angle that it brings it in is, if you look at, this is the wave here approaching at that angle, and then the sand would come right back out. Um, so this is all different successive layers of sand that have been deposited right here in the estuary. Um, I see something really big happening right here. We've got a creek coming, um, and the flow is probably from the bottom of the image towards the top but this sand has been deposited directly in the creek and pretty much covered it up, clogged it up. So what will happen? I mean, it's September. What has happened in the ensuing five months? I'm going to guess <laughs> that this water has found a way <laughs> to get through there and that a new channel has been cut straight somewhere through here. Um, because the water is not just going to stop. It's going to find a way to go. <laughs> um, but we may get, um, maybe we have a much larger beach area here now. And that's exciting. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned replenishments earlier. So when they replenish beaches, they just pump and dump straight on, which is very different than what's going on. Yes. Is that why they wash out pretty much one storm after they replenish them? Typically, when replenishment is done, that sand is brought from pretty far offshore, and, um, but it's, it's not coming from like right here. It's coming from maybe a, a mile out. Um, so it's, it, it's not this sand right here. Otherwise, they might as well just put it right there. <laughs> but um, yes, with replenishment, the idea is to bring in a lot more sand here. But it doesn't have this um, years and years of the ocean bringing it in and depositing it and leaving the heavier grains and it's not compacted at all. So it's not real, um, I want to say strong, but it's, it's maybe even more ephemeral than your typical barrier <laughs> island and that's why it, it doesn't last. Yes, ma'am. So when you say years and years, are you saying that that's happened over a longer period of time than say one storm event? Um, this right here, I would say is probably a, a single storm event, yeah. Remember, this is April, so we've had a, a winter, and um, I can't. It's so thick, you know, on the, on the of it. I don't know if that's because it was appropriate or not. I can't remember what was happening weather-wise in mid-April. I mean, I got my hair cut on the 15th, we all did our taxes, right, but, <laughs> but, huh, I can't, I can't remember if there was, um, you'd have to go back and maybe look at NOAA records and see if there was some kind of um, big storm event that would have done this. This is what it looks like to me, one event. Let's continue on with the beach renourishment thought here and talk about this mayhem going on right here. Um, this is... Ocean undermines beachfront condominium, Isle of Palms, South Carolina. So, um, all right, everybody loves the beach. Well, not everybody. Actually, I didn't love the beach for a long time. I hate sand in places where sand shouldn't be. But anyway, <laughs> um, lots of people appreciate the beach and, and want to live there. Well, that's great. Um, I am originally from New Jersey, where we have a long history of loving our beaches. So. How do we get the beach to stay there? <laughs> we want it to stop moving around. <laughs> um, and there are um, a lot of different ways that, that we see that people try and stabilize beaches, especially barrier islands. And I drew some more pictures for you. Um, there are, we're going to talk just about four main ways. But um, 
What we see uh, a lot happening, especially in Edisto area, are groins, and that's what this picture is. It's just kind of a hard structure, um, a single unpaired pile of riprap that comes out perpendicular to the beach. Here we've got the ocean at the bottom, the beach at the top. And these are pretty good, <laughs> but wherever we see groins, there's always going to be, because of that longshore current, there's going to be erosion on one side and deposition on the other side. And you've probably seen this if you've gone to the beach. See that one side, and I drew it with pencil, so it's kind of light here, but on one side it's eroded, and on the other side it's deposited sand. Well, if we um, have, say, an area where a creek or an important river, maybe, um, is uh, close to the beach and it's getting clogged with sand, they might pair the groins, now we're going to call them jetties, and jetties allow for when the tide comes in and out, um, they're so close together that it kind of concentrates the water, which helps swoosh the sand out of the channel. So paired jetties will keep the channel clear and deep so that boats can then continue using it. So jetties also pretty good. They work fantastic, but we will see the same kind of erosion on one side and deposition on the other. Um, I think there are places even in Edisto where there are like 25 of these groins all along the beach and on every single one, erosion on one side, deposition on the other. So um, in New Jersey, a lot of towns have said, all right, well, we are an awesome beach town. What we need is a sea wall. And that is going to keep the beach where it ought to be, keep the houses where it ought to be. The ocean's going to do its thing. And the problem is that the ocean does its thing. And <laughs> when you have a sea wall, I'll try and get this high enough so you don't see it. A sea wall, instead of being perpendicular to the beach, it's parallel to the beach. And it's up between the beach and the houses, the structures. Well, what does the ocean do? It takes the beach away. And then there's no beach. Not even a little cushion in front of your house. <laughs> so sea walls, not a good idea either. The only way to, and I'm going to, I want to use air quotes, but I'm trying to stop doing that. So the only way to kind of keep um, or even build up sand without renourishment is to build a breakwater. But a breakwater, again, you've got a hard structure out in the middle of the ocean. And that is going to promote sand buildup between the breakwater and the natural beach line. Um, a breakwater is often used, say, in front of an area where a marina is to keep the heavy waves from hitting the boat's full strength. Well, the problem is that if it's a marina, you're going to have to dredge it every once in a while because it will fill in with sand, and a marina is a place for boats, not cars. <laughs> but one way to build up the beach would be to build a breakwater. So what's going on here? Um, what's happened is that um, <clears throat> I hope we don't have any incredibly high-powered developers in the room, but basically <laughs> this structure was just built way too close to the shoreline. Um, and the ocean, doing what it does and has does for millennia, um, has taken away the sand here. There's no stabilization structure here. Um, well, <clears throat> we'll talk about that in a minute. But, <laughs> but there, there isn't any, no breakwaters, no jetties, no groins, no nothing here, certainly no seawall. But the ocean has just moved the sand along like it does. Maybe it's that sand right there. Um, I'm not sure because I haven't watched this for millennia to see what it's been doing. But this condominium is really in a difficult spot because there is no way to stop what's eventually going to happen. Um, in preparation for our little talk here today, I went on uh, Google Maps <laughs> and said, hey, let me take a look at that. And um, the Google Maps image is coming from um, this direction here, so we can really see you know, from the ocean into <clears throat> this area of Isle of Palms. And there are, on the image, if you look at the satellite image, there are several little walls built up around here, <laughs> into, and they're all flooded. There's seawater on the backside of every single one of the walls. Oh, and then piles and piles of sandbags right along here and along the next structure as well. 
piles and piles of sandbags. And this is not a hotel. These are, these are condominiums. People like live there <laughs> all the time. Um, so. So if they built a breakwater out there, would that help? Um, it might help, but again, the ocean's going to do what it's going to do. <laughs> and um, I guess, in summary, nature cannot be stopped here. <laughs> um, if a breakwater were to be built here, it, it could last for a long time and build up the beach, sure. And then I wonder about the next tropical storm or hurricane event could damage the breakwater. And what if one of those boulders was brought up and then hit the condominium? It's really just too close. If you ever go to a protected seaway or a, a national, um, national park on an island like that, they do ask that you not climb on the dunes. And that's because climbing on the dunes, although super fun, um, will actually wear them down and displace the sand. And that sand is there not just to be pretty and provide a place for the grass to grow, but that sand is there to help protect everything behind it. So when you break down the dunes or you build a condominium in front of the dunes, there's no protection. There's just, just nature had some protection for you there and you circumvented it. Look at the bottom of that picture. Is that okay. beach? Yeah, this is a golf course. <laughs> um, I think this is the 18th hole of this golf course right here. Right here? Yes. Um, and here is where, say, um, where a little dune system is trying to form. But um, golf courses are a pretty unnatural landscape. And so uh, this area should be a little bit lower. Maybe this was the former dune as well. It's hard to tell because there's been so much development here. I think there are even some people hanging out right there for scale. You see what that is. But um, uh, when, when we're done, you can come up and actually take a, a closer look without touching. But there you can see the little walls right in here that are trying to protect this giant <coughs> condominium. <coughs> bless you, <Sorry>. bless you. <laughs> but um, yeah, they've just kind of circumvented nature's only method of protecting the island and, and keeping the sand where it ought to be. I think we should all maybe do a field trip now. Oh, Go to the right. beach. <laughs> that sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, thank you all. I'll be around for a few minutes if you have any other questions. How'd I do on time? Okay. Thank you very much.